Welcome to Travel People, living authentic lives, finding kindred spirits, and fulfilling dreams. Sometimes we have to get lost for a while to live found and free. Here we talk about essential journeys, what I call beauty breaks for the soul. They lead us home to the people we were created to be. My guests are masters of reinvention and growth, and they live around the globe. They're going to share their travel go-to places and give insider tips on where and how to take time outs in their backyards. They'll inspire and empower you to plan your next adventure, to live your best life of relationship, rejuvenation, rest, whatever it is that you need and seek. I'm Cindy McCain, travel writer and blogger at Southern Girl Gone Global, where I share my journey as a mom, explorer of 27 countries, former expat, and empty nest survivor. When my children flew away, I did too. For a while, I landed in Morocco. After two years there and one in the Caribbean, I'm back in Nashville teaching university English, telling travel tales, and coaching others as they write theirs. I'm so excited to introduce you to some of the colorful cohorts that I've met from around the world, whose heads and hearts push me to press on in growth, live by core values, never settle, accept change. I'll never forget teaching high school students in Marrakesh. We study many works that are in our Western curriculum, but I particularly love teaching them the Odyssey and the Alchemist because I felt like I was living a journey at that time too. The mission of every episode that you will hear is that we remember the truths Alfred Lord Tennyson expressed in his poem, Ulysses. I am a part of all I have met. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a better world. For those of us healthy and at home, we're finding that being grounding can be grounding. We're more in need of connection than ever. Some of us are thinking about where we want to go from here. So maybe this is just the right time that we come together. Hey, guys, it is so good to see you again. Hey, Cindy. Good to see you, too. (laughs) How are you? Oh, Oh, we're we're doing doing great. great. Loving Thailand. (laughs) I'm sure you are. You are living the dream. You're living my dream. So I'm like, I want to be there, too. (laughs) How amazing. (laughs) So so I uh, have known uh, Kendra and David for a very long time. Sorry. That is my dog um, who is barking at something. Sorry. Just ignore her because she may make noises through this. Um, So I have known Kendra and David for a very long time. Um, I met Kendra Salsa Dancing, I think back in the days when we would go to Las Casuelas, I think, like way back in the day. In fact, I'm going to put a picture up of us at Las Casuelas. Yeah. Um, I think that was the Sunday night salsa thing or, you know, I don't know. It was some event. Uh, and then I remember being at your wedding, which was a beautiful event and doesn't seem that long ago, but wow, have you been up to a lot? Um, so, so just tell them a little bit and then we're actually going to, I'm actually going to show a video that tells your whole story, but, um, tell them where you are now and why you're there now. Yes, we're in Ao Nang, Thailand currently. And we chose to be here so we can ride out the pandemic. On February, we left to go on a two-year world tour where we were just going to country hop and explore around 100 different countries. Our goal is to um, find where we want to end up, where we want to live permanently. So we wanted to get a good sample of the world to make an educated decision on where we want to live. Yeah, and for all of you guys who are looking at this right now and thinking, oh, man, those guys must be rich or something. (laughs) We're not. We're not. Uh, Kendra and I were working three jobs each. We were your typical Americans. We were stressed out, overworked, underpaid. 
And we were traveling every moment that we could get some vacation time. Uh, we would go on, it started out, we would just take maybe one trip a year around the country. And then we would go uh, overseas. And then it went, you know, from one trip to two trips to three trips to four trips. <laughs> we would even go travel during Thanksgiving with our family. So we just started thinking about how much time we had and what we would do and what we would want to do. And Kendra came up with this wild idea and, and here we are, we're, we're on this journey. Now we sold everything and just sold the house and that's how we could afford to travel. So that is so amazing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to pause here because you all made a YouTube video that is so well done and it just shows some of the amazing places you've already been and kind of tells this whole story. So uh, we're just going to show everybody that and then we'll come back and talk some more. Hi guys! We're Kendra and David Lucas and we're currently living our dreams, traveling full time for the next two years. In this video, we're going to share with you how we went from being overworked and working three jobs to being able to go wherever we want, whenever we want, and live out our dreams traveling around the world. Our new lifestyle is not without challenges. We weren't expecting to be in the middle of a full-blown pandemic. But this is our new reality. We weren't expecting that countries would close their borders as we travel. I honestly didn't even know that was possible. We weren't expecting to be stranded in Thailand. But it is so beautiful to be stranded here. We have no idea where we'll be next month, but we don't regret the decisions that we've made. So stay tuned as we show you how we get started traveling full time, following our simple motto of imagine it, plan it, live it. So come along. So, we're from Nashville, Tennessee, also known as Music City, USA. We both worked in clinical trials in Nashville for many, many years. We also had side jobs of selling real estate, teaching English as a second language online, and teaching salsa dance to supplement and to hopefully one day replace our nine to fives. Salsa was a true passion for both of us. We loved the music and enjoyed how partner dancing made us feel so deeply connected to other people. We made powerful friendships through dance and with each class we taught, we were growing a community, creating new dancers every single week. It was a beautiful thing to be part of. But even as our businesses grew, we could never seem to drop the 9 to 5. It was like a security blanket that we were terrified to let go of. In the process of all of that, we were getting burned out. We were both working three jobs apiece, working to pay off debt, trying to get ahead. We had no days off and we're just, we were just hustling every day. And there's no way we could have kept up that pace or many years longer. So there were four big contributors to inspire us to make such a big change in our lives. Kendra and I really love to travel. So every waking moment that we had, that we could travel, whether it was with our family or if it was just us together, we would go to places like Italy, China, um, Spain, France, you name it. Anywhere we wanted to go, Thailand, anywhere we wanted to go, we would spend those times traveling and we used all our vacation time to do it. Mm -hmm. We started just doing one international trip a year, then two, then three, then four, until we knew that it was something that we wanted to do more than just vacation time. We wanted to travel full time. Another big inspiration to us were YouTube travel bloggers. Uh, I was always watching YouTube, getting travel ideas from other vloggers, and then I stumbled across vloggers who were living abroad full-time for $1,000 a month, 
and some traveling full time for just $2,000 a month. And my mind was blown about how economically they, they were traveling. And it's like, they're living my dream on far less money than I thought was necessary. So I thought if they can do it, why can't I do it? I wanna do that too. So that got my wheels turning and uh, trying to figure out how to make this all a reality. Our third big inspiration was our trip to Thailand. In 2019, Kendra and I, we took a trip, a tour of Thailand. We went to many cities. We went to Chiang Rai, Chiang Rai, Bangkok, Phuket, and we were really inspired by that trip. There was a lot of things that came about. Uh, meditation was one of the big things for Kendra. Uh, for me, I had been meditating for years, so for me it was just kind of eye-opening to see all the beautiful temples and all the beautiful beaches. and. We just had such a great time. I think it was the first time that we actually said, we could live here. Mm -hmm. This would be awesome. When we went, it was the first time uh, that I really got into meditation. Uh, going to the temples, seeing how people would meditate, and our tour guide as well was talking about her practice with meditation. And it really got me into doing more research. So, uh, meditation really is the fourth contributor to what kind of inspired me. Uh, when I got back home, I joined a meditation group and over the weeks and months of practicing, um, I just got more calm, I was more at peace, and I was able to let go of a lot of the fears that was keeping me working three jobs. Like I was always worried about losing my job, uh, losing the house, of having financial trouble and I was working excessively more than needed to survive and meditation helped me realize I really don't need three jobs and I realized that we had enough if we sold everything we could travel comfor comfortably for years so that was a huge revelation that I wouldn't have gotten if I just kept on following my same pattern Meditation helped me stop my regular pattern and see something different for myself. And because of meditation, I asked David one day, uh, what do you think about selling the house, uh, selling everything we have, quitting our jobs, and you know, just traveling the world for a couple of years? And he said, When do we leave? <laughs> <laughs> And I was so surprised about that. I thought he would take some more convincing, but it was an instantaneous yes for him. So once we were both in agreement, it just came down to planning how we were going to do this crazy, crazy life change. So we knew the equity in our home was enough to finance the trip. So our big plan was to sell the house, and to use the proceeds to travel for two years. Selling the house was the most practical thing to do for us because it's so hard to travel full time when you have to take care of a property distantly and it's so much more expensive. Uh, we would have had to hold back traveling for years if we had to maintain a home in the US while traveling at the same time. Selling the house both gave us the money we need and it took away one big worry that we no longer have to, we can travel freely knowing we don't have to take care of anything back home. Once we made the decision we were gonna sell the house, there was there were several steps we had to take. Um, fortunately for me, I'm a real estate broker, so I think about these things differently than Kimberly. Mm -hmm. um, I've been selling properties for years, I knew our, we had a great home, um, we got our property at a very low price when the market was down. So I knew that there was quite a bit of equity in it. I knew the house would sell. Uh, we took very good care of the house. There were some things that we needed to uh, fix on the house. As, a, as many houses, you know, there's things that get overlooked. So we did those things. But I had no, I had no doubt that the house would sell soon. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we got top dollar for our investment. And um, once we set out to do that, I was gonna make that happen. We put the house on the market and every day it was on the market, I was as nervous as can be, like praying every day, please sell, please sell. 
because we couldn't live out our dreams if we couldn't sell the house. David was cool as a cucumber the whole time though. But within 20 days, we did finally get a full price offer. Yay! And that put everything in motion. It was really easy once we got the offer and everything on contract. So we bought the house in 2012 for about $135,000 and sold in 2019 for $284,000. Because we had this asset and because it appreciated so much, it made traveling uh, very easy for us, fortunately. So when they say real estate is the best investment you can make, they are not joking people, do it. <laughs> And since we were successful in selling the house, next we had to decide what type of travelers we wanted to be. Um, we didn't really want to be as low budget as some of the backpackers we saw on YouTube, but yet we wanted to still go think about the longevity of our trip. Um, so we didn't want to do luxury travel either. So we consider ourselves more mid-range, mid-level travelers. Uh, and we really focus on keeping our budget low, trying to stay in hotels that are less than $50 a night, which is actually pretty easy to do in Southeast Asia, and just focus on eating at street food or small local restaurants, trying to keep our food costs low as well. I had originally budgeted us as traveling under uh, $6,000 a month, so $3,000 per person. But as we've been traveling, uh, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to keep the budget even less than that. So we've been spending just $5,000 a month, or $2,500 per person. Yeah, and with that, Kendra and I, we traveled for many years, and we really would spend the money. I mean, we would, you know. We, we would spend a lot. <laughs> We were working three jobs, people. <laughs> well, we love to travel, and so traveling to us was a luxury, yeah. and we treated ourselves well. So spending for traveling for vacationing was very different from this. This was yeah. gonna be a long-term endeavor for two years, so we wanted to keep a, a reasonable budget, not the lofty budget we're used to, uh, but we were, we were very careful and, Kendra's a meticulous planner, so we were able to still keep the cost low and not spend, you know, like the big ballers we normally <laughs> are. So we wanted, we, to be re to be. we wanted to be reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, when we were still working three jobs and we would go on vacation, we would take uh, tours that were not per se expensive, but they weren't cheap either, and we would eat out at the most expensive places and we would get unnecessary souvenirs that we all wound up throwing in the trash later and all these little things that you aren't conscious of when you're on vacation but you have to be conscious of when you make travel your lifestyle so we cut out all the very expensive tours we still take tours but we make sure we take the shorter and the less expensive tours and just focus on keeping our food budget really low eating where locals eat um, because we try to make ourselves seem, feel like a local if, that, if you will instead of eating at the more ritzy touristy places. Let me give you an example of that. Um, Kendra and I when we go to cities we think when are we going to get back to that city? It, it'll probably be rare, it'll probably be never. So when we were going to those cities for vacationing we wanted to do everything without regret. So if it meant spending a little extra, we would do that. On um, this type of trip is different. I'll give you an example. When we were in Singapore, everybody knows about the Eternity Pool in Singapore. Oh, the, the Infinity Pool. The Infinity Pool, sorry, in, in Singapore. Everybody knows about that. Kendra, to Kendra, that's not a big deal. To me, that's a big deal, okay? I want to be in the infinity pool. That's me. That's my lifestyle. I love stuff like that. We didn't go, you know, on this trip. We were there. We were in the building. We were a floor down from it. 
but we were in the infinity pool of this trip. Because it costs $300 a night to stay at the hotel, probably more than that, and that just wasn't in the budget. And just not doing the luxurious things uh, for the next two years. And that's a compromise mm -hmm. when you're thinking about doing something for two weeks versus two years. That's a compromise that you have to be able to make if you want to do go the distance. Yes. If you want to feel secure, if you want to feel like you know you can go for a long time. Some sacrifices mm -hmm. in the budget may need to be accounted for. But the the journey really makes up for it. The experiences that we are getting are invaluable. And to turn down, you know, the a fancy infinity pool is not really a huge sacrifice at the end of the day. <laughs> so once we had our plan done and the budget done, it all that was left is to live the dream. So we've taken all our possessions down to two pieces of luggage of peeps, a backpack and um, a roller bag. It's so freeing to have so few possessions. Um, we sold everything else. We sold all our little trinkets, our furniture, our cars. And now with these two bags, we can be packed and ready to go anywhere on the planet in just 30 minutes. The hardest part was saying goodbye to friends and family that we're close to and that we were leaving behind in the United States. We're both social butterflies. <laughs> so we were a big part of our community in Nashville, Tennessee. We love all our friends. I try to stay close to some of our friends even as I'm abroad. Uh, I may text them or uh, send them messages on Facebook or different things like that on WhatsApp. So I, start, I try to stay in touch with people. But it's difficult um, being away from your close friends. It was bittersweet to close that chapter in our lives. But this new chapter really does feed a part of our souls that we weren't able to before. Um, we feel the most alive when we're traveling and we're just so lucky and so incredibly happy that we have the opportunity to do what we want when we want. Before, salsa dance was really our only way to express our creative side, but now the whole world is our muse and we get to express ourselves through our photos and through our videos and we just love sharing the world with you guys. Please give the video a like. Leave us a comment. And please remember to hit that red subscribe button. Okay, so wow, anybody out there that doesn't think that looks amazing. Um, I I've, I've was told I have a friend that has uh, is an international teacher and taught all over the world. And she says that the beaches in Thailand are the most beautiful of anywhere. Would you all agree? Yes. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> um, so this is maybe the second city or the second beach town that we've been to in yeah. Thailand. Amazing. And Al Nang is definitely our favorite, the most beautiful we've been to so far. There's beautiful limestone mountains and they're such unique shapes. You can just look at them for hours. They're mm. gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And it's just so gorgeous to look out into the ocean and see these little islands that are just so beautifully shaped and the sea's so blue. And you can island hop. There's so many gorgeous islands that you could see. And the sunsets are so unique every night. Every sunset, so beautiful, different colors. So there's a lot to see on these beaches here in Thailand. Yeah, she's absolutely right about the beaches here. Um, I basically go running on the beach every day. Uh, that's part of my exercise because the gym has been closed. The, it, the gym is open now here in our building. The pool is open now here in our building. But um, I just walk down the street a few minutes and I start jogging. And uh, I jog along this beautiful beach every day. It's wow. gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. So you said that the 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 um, 
public gyms and things are closed. So how is quarantine working there? So we, we arrived in Thailand around March 24th. And when we arrived, nearly everything was already sh shut down. So we couldn't take any tours. Um, the, all the restaurants were closed for a uh, dine-in. You could only take out. And really, most of the shops and retail facilities were closed because there weren't enough customers to sustain them. Um, naturally, pools started to close down. And uh, Al Nang was unique, actually, because them as a city, they decided to close all the hotels but one. So they put all the tourists in the same hotel, which it was in our cup of tea. So that was one thing about the quarantine here that we didn't like. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we were able to find an Airbnb condo to stay in. Uh -huh. So we've been in the condo ever since and love it. It has a great view of the sea, which is something we just wouldn't have gotten in the tourist hotel. So Oh, wow. That's amazing. Things worked out well, but naturally... Eh, the whole stay-at-home policies, it, it's not the most fun, but we still, the beaches were open the whole time, so we were still able to have some source of outdoor activity, some source of enjoyment the whole time. Now, um, you asked a question about being here. Why, why did we choose to come here? We saw that all the countries were closing borders, uh -huh. and we saw the demand that, the, you know, um, that the president made, I wanted everybody to come back to the U.S. And we looked at each other and we were like, we're not going back. <laughs> not right now. Uh -uh. Not, not back right now. So coming here was actually not on our plan. Uh -huh. um, we, had, we had set out kind of a two-year plan of different areas we wanted to go to around the world. We decided to come here. We had been here, not here. We had been in the country of Thailand last year. So coming back to Thailand was not a part of the plan. Um, we were going to skip over Thailand. But when we asked each other the question, where would we like to ride out this pandemic if all these other countries closed, where would we like to be? Uh, Thailand came up and we decided to come here. Fortunately, we came to the right vicinity, the right community, the right city, everything. We got super lucky, yes. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, wait a second. It's so perfect here. Yeah. So in, in Thailand, they really didn't have, they as a country, they've only had a little over 3,000 cases. So when you compare that just to the where we're from, the state of t Tennessee alone, it's much less cases. And the government has ma managed it in such a way that, now there's been no um, cases in our province for a while. So things have been able to get back to normal. Uh, it's taken, what, three months? So mm -hmm. that was about the time frame it took for things to have zero cases. So it, was, it took a while, you know, waiting around, wearing our masks. Yeah. Um, and, but now uh, they've opened up things. Restaurants are opening. Stores are opening. So things are getting back to normal slowly but surely. And they have a, a very aggressive testing policy here. Okay. Um, I have not seen this in the U.S. yet. But here, we found that before you could come here on the plane, we had to get tested for COVID-19. Okay. And we had to be negative, And we had to have certificates to be able to come here. Then once we arrived, um, we had to produce those those uh, documents for our hotels. Mm -hmm. um, they take your temperature, okay, because that's one of the ways that they monitor, making sure that you're okay. Um, a lot of the stores that you went in, there were hand sanitizer, and they would take your temperature at the store. Um, also, if you if your temperature was out of range. Uh, they would take you to a facility and make sure that you were being treated and they would track and <clears throat> excuse me and make sure that you were healthy. They didn't want you to be a health risk. So right now they're actually inviting people uh, back into Thailand and they're testing those folks and monitoring those folks. So I will say that from what I've seen around the U.S. compared to here, um, the treatment and the the not not 
I wouldn't say security, but however they do their mm-hmm. tracking and their monitoring mm-hmm. is very, um, very good because you want to feel safe everywhere that you go. Right. You want to know if someone's had the virus and these different things. Well, they have a way of tracking and finding that. Like, for example, if someone tests positive here, they are immediately admitted into the hospital. They, that's it. So whereas in other places, people are sent home to self-quarantine, right. here they're just in the hospital the whole time until they're able to have two, um, two um, negative. negative tests. Mm-hmm. So, and in that way, it helps make sure people are getting the best care and it also helps to really isolate the infected people so they don't go out and infect the community. And they have international flights coming in, just Thai people repatriate it back. But all these people, they have to quarantine in a government facility for 14 days. And as they're doing this, um, they found 17 people. Um, They've arrived in the country. They had a negative COVID-19 test. They wait a few days and then they test them again. And then 17 people had a positive test. So they are catching new cases in this way. And as of yesterday, the only, they only had 17 new cases yesterday and they were all people coming in from the outside that are in these quarantine okay. facilities. Okay. So the country's doing quite well. Um, so we were very impressed with Thailand in that regard. Yeah, but you gotta understand, they test everybody. So in that sense of, um, I like right now, I think if I was walking around in the US, I probably wouldn't get tested unless I was very, very sick and went to the hospital. Right. Um, Kendra and I, when we were tested, we were not sick, but they tested us as a precaution. Right. So that means that they are trying to offset the virus before it even, you know, gets full blown. Right. I think a lot of the issues that they're having in America is people are showing up at the hospitals already really, really sick. Mm-hmm. These folks here, uh, if they happen to get sick, they're catching it beforehand so that they can go ahead and start treatment. And yeah. the people that, that go into the hospital, how what what is how much is health care there? I mean, compared to here. Like I I don't want I don't want to get sick for many reasons, but one is I don't want to have to go in a hospital and then have bills that'll take me years to pay off. So we are fortunate that we have not been sick here, so we really don't know the cost. Yeah. Um, part of the rules for coming here, though, because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So where we were, we were in Vietnam, uh-huh. and Vietnam was shutting down really rapidly. So we knew we wanted to get out of there. Um, but as David said, we had to get a COVID-19 test, and we had to have $100,000 worth of travel insurance, medical insurance. Mm-hmm. So... There's no way for us to know how much treatment for if an illness like COVID-19 would cost, right. but that was the requirement at that time. You had to have at least $100,000 worth of um, coverage. I mean, I just wonder what the coverage is like for their their people, their citizens, you know, if it's what kind of health care they would have some there. I don't know. So. Fortunately, we don't know that either. No, I've never really asked. We've met some people here, but I haven't asked that question. I will say this. Um, you know how, like, when they shut down and they shut businesses down uh-huh. and different things like this? Yeah. I was really impressed by them because when they shut these businesses down, it seems as though the government was really, really helpful to the folks who were out of work. Mm -hmm. Um, We would see restaurants providing food for people and different things like that. Um, And it showed me that there's a lot more in America that we could be doing for people who are out of work than what we are doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's one thing to get a $1,200 check sent Mm -hmm. to a family, but it's another thing to feed that family for a month or two months or three months if they have to be out of work. Yeah. Uh, providing food or, or that kind of thing, because these were restaurants cooking for people yeah. like, you know, real restaurants. People were coming and picking up meals for their families that were, you know, cooked in a professional restaurant. Yeah. 
Wow. So to me, that showed just that, you know, that they had compassion mm -hmm. for, you know, they didn't just shut their businesses down and say, fend for yourselves. You know, they were, they were showing some sort of compassion about, you know, we know you still got to feed your family. We know right. you've still got to have a place to live and these things. So, right. So you, in the beaches, so you, but you were able to go to the beaches even during quarantine, but you, they weren't real, real crowded. Like it's not like the Florida beaches where everybody's kind of on top of each other or. No. Correct. Uh, this is a fairly small town in Thailand mm -hmm. and it's not very populated. Mm -hmm. So once uh, tourists is pretty much dead, so there's not that many foreigners here. Right. And uh, yes, yeah, so the, the beach is quite spacious. It's very easy to socially distance at the beach. Um, so you'll see the pictures. It, it looks like I'm the only person out there on the yeah, beach. It does. Yeah. People are away, but, um, it's really easy. It's just, it's just not that many people here. Yeah. I, I, you know, I used to say to my friends, cause you'll see on Facebook, I do a lot of little stories and posts on Facebook and people will ask, you know, are you alone? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm really not. I'm really not alone. Yeah. And now, after, you know, being here several months, you'll see people start to warm up to you, and, and they'll actually come a lot closer than they than they had in the past because they were just so, they didn't know who you were, they didn't know where you were from, and they don't, you know, and right. they just want to respect. that. You, and, and first of all, too, one of the reasons we came to Thailand is because we feel like the Thailand, we've heard before in the past that people in Thailand are the nicest people in the world. And it's really true. They really are. Oh, <laughs> They're the horrible. kindest people you ever want to meet. They're the salt of the earth. They really are. And so, you know, but there are people out and about and they're mingling and socializing, but they keep their distance and they, you know, and they interact within, you know, their, their social circles and things like that. Um, and they've been very kind to us. We've not had any issues with anyone, you know. Yeah, one of the best things about it is once the government decided to close their borders mm -hmm. and they just extended amnesty to all of the tourists. So usually a tourist is only allowed to stay 30 days mm -hmm. and then you can extend right. for another 30 days. So maximum 60 days in Thailand. But they just said that we're, nobody can go anywhere. Right. So they've extended our visas until July 31st. And that's how we've been able to stay in Thailand so long without having to do any extra visa paperwork. So we were just so thankful to be yeah. able to get the type of kindness from the government that they allowed us to stay this long. Mm -hmm. And we've heard so many people like yourself who were international teachers and stuff. They've yeah. told us they just got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were here. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. We're really in a in a place that feels like paradise. I, I, it looks know, like it's paradise. <laughs> it, it, it really feels that way. And, you know, we're very fortunate. Every day I wake up and look out the window to see if it's still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's, it looks, the pictures just absolutely look amazing. So, um, and I love a beach. I, you know, I like the mountains. I like other landscapes, but. I do love a beach. So I, I think that looks pretty cool, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> if so, where have you gone before getting there other than Vietnam? Was that it or had you been somewhere else before that? Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, we've been a lot of places. You guys have so been a lot. I, yeah. So on this tour, we left February um, 2020. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we started in Indonesia, so we spent some time in Bali, Indonesia, oh, yeah. different temples in Ubud, and then we went down to the beach, um, Legon, uh -huh. in order to take surfing lessons. So we got to spend, you know, four days just learning how to surf, which, yeah. is which was amazing. exhilarating. Oh, that's our wonderful. It's a perfect place to learn to surf. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then from there, we went to Yogyakarta, which is on the island of Java in Indonesia. And for there, we were just looking at the 
grand temples of Borobudur and Prabhanan. From there, we flew to Singapore, where we just fell in love with the city. That's like awesome. one of our favorite cities Singa in the world Singa now. Singapore is amazing. People talk about Singapore, and you know, in the travel circuit, people talk about Singapore. Um, I was so impressed by that place. I was thrilled by it. It would be very difficult for us to live there because it's so expensive, mm -hmm. but it was beautiful. It's very, very clean, very, very progressive. Um, there's almost next to no violence there. It's gorgeous. And mm -hmm. so in, in Asia, I would say to me, Singapore is the diamond. It's wow. our favorite. Is say. it? Okay. Yeah, Singapore is worth your visiting. In the terms of city, naturally, Thailand is our favorite for beaches. But yes. City life. Singapore is definitely it. Yeah. Well, I, saw, yeah. I do. I do remember now seeing your pictures in Bali, and I've always wanted to go there. Were you? Was it as? I mean, to me, that would be great. What did you think about Bali? Hmm. What's your feeling on Bali? So we enjoyed the beaches in Bali. It was set, for us. It was just a little. Um, how you say? It didn't jive with our spirits. It just felt a little challenging, mm -hmm. uh, especially when we were in Ubud, um, because it, uh, the surrounding area is not so developed. So traveling is very slow and a little difficult. Mm -hmm. We hired a okay. private driver to get around. Um, and just to go maybe 20 miles away can take you an hour and a half. Oh, wow. It's a two-lane highway with children and animals and yeah. <laughs> very slow trucks. Yeah, and I say. It, it was just a challenging experience on many different levels. Yeah. And we got a little bit of the Bali belly, that traveler's diarrhea that you don't oh, want to get. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that kind of colored our experience okay. as well. Yeah. Of, uh, like even just a little bit of that water on your vegetables or just a little bit of that yeah. water on your toothbrush can really <laughs> yeah. put a damper on your trip. Mess, it can mess you up for a couple of days. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. so our experience in Bali and Ubud versus being at the beach were totally different because the beach towns are so catered to tourism. It felt more home-like, if, if you will, because okay. we were in a resort and we were just going surfing and going back to the resort. But when we really got into the island, we we're like, oh my goodness. And that was the first country we went to as well. So yeah, so for us, Bali was a mixed bag. <laughs> okay, okay. It's a, a friend of mine, the same friend that's taught everywhere, I think she told me, is it that is it orchids or there's some sort of flowers that are just, they put everywhere. I don't know. It's something they're known for. I don't know. Did you, were there lots of flowers and <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there, there are lots there are of lots flowers. Of flowers. I mean, so, it's such a fertile land. Yeah. That grow super easily. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there were flowers everywhere, especially cause they all have their spirit houses where they say their prayers. Mm -hmm. So you'll see flowers all in the streets. They have these little square boxes right. with flowers in them where they offer offerings to the gods. Yeah. So you'll see flowers everywhere just in offerings alone. I think that's what, yeah, I think that's what she was talking about. And she, mm -hmm. uh, actually, I did see your travel guides on your website, mm -hmm. um, which we'll be mentioning this a lot and link to it, but it's lucasworldtravel.com. And you mm -hmm. had guides to Thailand and you had guides to Singapore and also, um, and I'm probably going to say this wrong. Is it, um, uh, she always called it KL, but it's Kuala Lumpur. Lumpur. Yeah. So how did you like it there? Oh, okay. So that's where we went after Singapore. So we took the bus uh, from Singapore up to Kuala Lumpur mm -hmm. and that city's lovely. Uh, we spent most of our time, you know, seeing the Patronus Towers, which are like the icon of Malaysia. And that area is so beautiful because of the architecture of the building. Mm -hmm. And you can go into the building and see a great view of the city. 
and it has parks and fountains and a shopping mall. And then within walking distance, the tourism center, my favorite part of our experience there was going to see the cultural dance show. You know, I'm a dancer, so I love dance. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was such a well done, beautiful oh, show. Oh, great. And at the end, they allow you to come onto the stage and dance, and it just warmed my heart. Oh. And I got all teary eyed <laughs> because I was just, uh, I remember I saw an advertisement for Malaysia when I was traveling in Tanzania as a college student, actually. And I don't know why my spirit always says, I'm going to go there. I want to go there. Malaysia is where it's at. And it was like a dream come true for me to be able to go there. Oh, that's so, wonderful. That was a lovely experience. It was. It was quite lovely. It was a beautiful place to go. Um, I actually met a friend back in Thailand in 2019. And just so happened, she was in the city and she was taking some computer coding classes. So she invited us out to go salsa dancing, ah. which, which was pretty amazing. So we actually caught up with a friend that we met the year before <laughs> in another country. <laughs> Wonderful. I like that was really cool. So the good thing we got to dance in Kuala Lumpur as well. Ah. And every time we're able to dance in a city, it just makes our joy of that city that much better. I remember uh, we also got to dance in Singapore as well, and uh, that just made us fall in love with Singapore. Amazing that much dancers more. there, mm -hmm. amazing dancers, yeah. This is yeah. why I mean they say it's the world's dance because literally, yeah. you know, that was what I loved about getting into the salsa scene here in Nashville is that I met people from all over the world, and that is so yeah. cool that you all are getting to to dance everywhere. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. They're, they're yeah. wonderful dancers, by the way, and wonderful teachers. I really, that's, I'm, I'm so happy for you, but we all really miss you. And, you know, we're, it's, it's sad because we, you, they just used to have wonderful social events and, and really, really did a lot for this city when it comes to the, the world of dance. So wonderful yeah. teachers. So. Thanks. Pleasure. So really other than, um, so really, you kind of were able to sort of follow what you had planned until you ended up deciding you needed to go to Thailand to sort of ride this thing out. Right. And after um, Kuala Lumpur as well, we were on schedule. We went to Siem Reap, Cambodia as well oh. to see Angkor Wat, okay. and, um, so, which was lovely. And then we started our tour of Vietnam, and we had five cities planned in Vietnam. And we did go through all those cities, but starting around our second city in Vietnam, things were getting progressively worse with the um, virus. Right. So that's when we started to get a little uncomfortable. Right. Because um, as you can imagine, the, Viet the government in Vietnam is very strict. Yeah. And so they would shut down businesses left and right if... Um, somebody tests positive for the mm -hmm. COVID-19, yeah. they find out where that person's been for the last 14 days and they l shut down every hotel, every restaurant that person went to. Oh, so wow. you can imagine all the tourists go to the same places. So they shut down everything a tourist would see everything. very mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that it got so uncomfortable that there was hardly any place to eat because all tourists go to the same spots to eat. Why? So at the end, at our last city, we were having real struggles. And we were like, let's go. So Vietnam was gorgeous. It was beautiful. We would love to go back to see it under better conditions. Yeah. But man, during that pandemic, it was a little challenging. Yeah. But I must say that even though they were super strict and it was quite uncomfortable, they did a good job at controlling the outbreak. And they're one of the countries that had the least cases. So their methods worked, but yeah. it was quite harsh, their methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the first person that I, uh, interviewed on these was my friend who is in Spain and mm -hmm. they were locked down there for quite some time. And, uh, she lived in a city where a lot of people don't have a yard, a garden, a balcony. And so that meant, um, you know, they could not leave their house. 
uh, if they did, they had to show a receipt that they'd been to the grocery or a medical paper saying they'd been to the doctor or they would get fined 600 euros. So it was very wow. serious. Um, and then my friend that's in Morocco, she's actually Australian. Um, and we were friends when I was there and she, it's very strict there. They, um, have a curfew every night. They have to carry a paper stating that they are, you know, what they're allowed to do. And in her case, again, it would just be a medical emergency or going to the grocery. Uh, and otherwise they're, they're inside. So they go, they have a court, well, they go up to the rooftop, you know, two or three of them and stay socially distanced and kind of do laps or run the stairs just to be able to have exercise because mm -hmm. that was a really locked down situation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's why when people here, you know, were, or are, have protested wearing masks and I'm just thinking that is nothing compared to what people in some countries have, it's been way stricter than that. I mean, you know, the thing is, in Asia, they haven't shut down anything the whole time. It, like, I, how do I explain this? It's not that they're making people stay at home. Uh -huh. They'll shut down a business, but they won't make you stay in your house, if that okay. makes sense. Okay. So nobody is forced to stay in the home. It's, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's just that they only shut down affected businesses. Okay. outside of naturally they wouldn't shut down a grocery store that's the only business they wouldn't shut down if an affecting person just went essential, there essential business just essential businesses right but everything else in vietnam they would shut down mm -hmm. um so in that way for the locals it was business as usual in a way right um people who only catered to locals they didn't have any trouble at all really um, it was just the tourism industry that was so badly hit by it because right. it's not really the it, it was really in their situation, foreigners, tourists, people coming home to Vietnam that were bringing the virus. So, so how are you doing most of your travel? Well, when you were traveling, when the borders were open, were you, how were you getting around mostly? Oh, Okay. So we would, it's mostly flights. Yeah. Um, I would plan by looking at this website, Rome to Rio. Yeah, to I love that. Mm -hmm. the best way to travel between yeah. cities. Yeah. Sometimes we would fly. Sometimes we would take a bus. Um, but it was usually either going to be bus or it's going to be flight to between cities. And we also just try to look to see, is it... Um, yeah, what's the most logical route to take? Mm -hmm. If we know we want to hit these countries and we know we want to hit these cities, we try to go in the most logical, cost-effective order as possible. Right. So I'm Unless always, I, I plan my trips now just looking at the map of the world and just seeing, oh, okay, yeah. this, it's, we were supposed to go to not Lao next, which is right next door to Vietnam, yeah. but Lao closed their borders, so... Mm -hmm. That's where the planning kind of stopped. Now we're living day by day, really. Right. I want to take a quick break. When I come back, I want to hear some other things that were on your list. Hopefully, you will eventually get to those places. Um, so we'll just take a quick break. Okay. Okay. So we're back. Um, so I am dying to hear some other places on your list. Uh, you know, assuming that all the borders will eventually open. Where else are you headed? Well, we are, I'm really itching to go to Taiwan next to see Taipei. Yeah. Um, there's so many fascinating things there that I want to explore. Yeah. And then Seoul, South Korea, and uh, Japan. So many different cities in Japan I'm curious to uh, explore. So those are our top three next countries. Um, before the pandemic, we also had planned to go to Laos, and the Philippines, um, also India and Bhutan. But now, <laughs> because of the current environment, we might hold off a little bit longer on those just to see politically and um, virus-wise how right. that's going to play out. Right. Uh, um, India especially can be challenging for a tourist, and we were going to take a tour of India to try to 
have the best experience as possible. Um, so we'll just see uh, if those tours are possible. Right. Um, and also, really, I'm dying to go to Bhutan. We also had a tour plan to go to Bhutan, yeah. which is yeah. one of the most remote places, doesn't have any traffic lights. Yeah. And that was really going to be the highlight of our trip, I feel. And yeah. I'm just so sad that that one got canceled. So can't wait to rebook that one. Yeah. yeah. The uh, Well, I was just going to say the the I released uh, one of these uh, episodes yesterday, and my friend... Uh, had been to Bhutan and said that was one of her favorite wow. trips of all time. Uh, oh, and wow. then and then the Taipei, Taiwan, the friend of mine that teaches there is the one who kind of was a mentor and said she had already been in Casablanca when I went to Morocco. And she said, do it, just do it, you know. And so, but she has asked me before, would you like to come teach in Taipei? And I'm like, oh, wow. So you ought to check it out and tell me about it. <laughs> oh, we will. We'll share Photo and video, you'll yeah. uh, feel like you're there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's other places that we had reserved for like the second year or going into the late part of the year, which would have been like uh, New Zealand and like, you know, up toward uh, Sweden, Switzerland, Scotland, all of those different places, yeah. then down toward uh, Africa, Morocco, and yeah. different places like that as yeah. well. So, you know, um, when you're able to see 40, 50 countries a year yeah. versus seeing one, two, three a year, you know, it, it, it's very different. Right. Uh, so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get to those. Hopefully they'll open up their borders and we'll get a chance to see some of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And if you would, I mean, I know the video talks about this as well, but just to kind of reiterate um, how affordable it is to oh, travel yeah. compared to what our life cost here, you know? Wow. Yeah. Yes. So um, our goal was to spend less than $50 a night for a hotel. And that's been really easy so far. The only mm -hmm. exception was Singapore. But we've been spending, you know, $36 a night up to maybe $45 a night if we're getting really ritzy. Mm -hmm. Um, and also just the plane, the flights here are super inexpensive. We're getting $35 flights to yeah. go to, uh, different countries even. Yeah. Yeah. So once we got to Bali, um, our plane ticket to get to Bali was one way, $600. And that was our biggest expense. Yeah. And once we got there, uh, the food was very inexpensive. We were spending maybe two to three dollars a person for a meal and here in thailand we have um this lovely lady across the street that makes our lunch and dinner and it's only two dollars wow. per meal wow so very affordable um so we're spending much less traveling full-time than we were living in the u.s yeah. and that's just mind-blowing um, I got the inspiration from travel bloggers seeing that they were yeah. traveling full time for just two thousand yeah. dollars a month. Yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness, I spend so much more than that living in the US. Yeah. It's like let me go live my dream. Absolutely. Do exactly what I want to and save money at the same time. So yeah. let me tell you about a light bulb moment Kendra had before we left the United mm -hmm. States. It was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> As she was saying to me, she was saying you know, this travel is going to be so expensive. Um, she was booking tickets or something like that, or looking at booking tickets online or something. And I was like, babe, we're only going one way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're going one way. We're not going back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. Yeah. And she was like, oh, my God, that, like, half our budget. That's <laughs> it's like, true. Yeah, true. It's true, right? It's true. Because when we would travel for two weeks at a time, the largest ex ex expense, of course, was getting overseas, right? Absolutely. And getting back home. Yep. Right? Yep. Well, we're going one way, and then we just keep going. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've said this so many times. You know, we, when I was in Morocco, there was a Ryanair and an EasyJet hu hubs there. And so if we wanted to go to Spain for two or three days, it, it was, you know, you could get round-trip tickets if you watched for $50. And, you know, people spend that going to Target. A Target yeah. run is $50 or more, you know. 
but you're mm-hmm. able to go to Spain. <laughs> and if you stay, <laughs> you know, in a B, in an Airbnb, we uh, a friend of mine, we she found this really great one actually in Portugal, and I think that that room ended up costing us. I don't know, twenty dollars, you know, maybe a piece. I mean, forty dollars maybe, but we were right on the Douro River. I mean, it was like prime, you know, balcony location. So you can't. I mean, my goodness, here in Nashville, it costs so much to stay in a hotel. It's ridiculous, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I'll share this. Um, just like when we went to Singapore, uh-huh. and this is the difference from traveling for two weeks versus traveling for two years. Um, When Kendra and I were were traveling for vacation, we were working, we were making good money, so we would naturally spend a lot more on a vacation trip. You know, we wanted to see everything we could see while we were there. We didn't know when we would ever get back to a city, so we wanted to see all the attractions and have the full experience, okay? So, Because of that, we probably spent a lot more money, probably two or three times as much because it was a big vacation for us, okay? Mm -hmm. So now when you're traveling for two years, you have to monitor that budget, right? Because you can't just spend as crazy as you would on a two-week vacation for a two-year kind of a vacation, Yep. And there's different traveling for different people. Some people are hikers, some people are campers, some people are visiting family, and some people are working, okay? Where if you're working, your your company's footing the bill or something like right, that. Right, right. This money's coming out of our own budget. So that means that, you know, um, in Nashville, maybe it's three fifty or $500 a night at a hotel, yep. something like that. Um in Singapore, it's very common that those there that there's some big, beautiful resorts, big, beautiful hotels. And in your mind, three hundred and fifty dollars a night may not be a lot, but for, if you're on a two year trip, three hundred and fifty dollars easily adds up. Okay? <laughs> right. right. So you forego spending three hundred and fifty dollars a night and decide to spend a you know, sixty dollars a night in a small room instead right. of having sure. the, you know, sure. and that's the difference for the type of traveling we're doing now versus the traveling we've done in the past. Sure. You know, yeah. we're monitoring the budget, sure. but understanding that, you know, a really, really good, tasty meal only costs us two dollars. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's amazing. I've heard versus, the food there is good and it's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of airlines we've used, the low cost carriers here are Air Asia. Mm-hmm. And when we were in Vietnam, we always used the Vietnam Airlines. For us, all I do is I usually research like Google Flights, Expedia mm-hmm. first, mm-hmm. see what airlines even go from city to city. But usually, then I always go and book on the airline's website. I just much prefer that because I get better information. Um, For example, with the pandemic, there were so many flight cancellations, Mm -hmm. so many schedule changes, and the airline would contact me directly with those versus I booked one flight through Expedia, and that was a disaster. I didn't get any information. I couldn't get anybody on the phone. Luckily, I was able to get a refund for that flight completely. That was the only good thing. But in terms of getting information, it, you can't really get that from a third party like Expedia. Plus, I just find the flights are cheaper if you buy directly yes. as well. Get yes. better service. Mm-hmm. So I just use those resources, and the flights have been very inexpensive. That's correct. Yeah, and now, now there's a website, and we mentioned this in one of our videos. Now there's a website that will give you all the coronavirus uh, information for that city. Okay. They will tell you what the regulations are for that city. They will tell you what the limitations are for that city, um, if you need to quarantine in that city. Because there are cities now that are opening up, and you won't have to do that two-week quarantine, which is very, very important for a traveler because two weeks of sitting in a room versus two weeks of sightseeing right. is, is huge, right? So yeah. 
you know, if, if you can avoid that, you know, you want to, because if you're not sick and you're still having to sit in a room for, for two weeks, you're paying for a room and that's really useless to you, right? Right. So it, they, they have a website now that monitors that for cities. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's helpful. Yeah, it's called flattenthecurve.global. And you literally just put in that country you're interested in, and it gives you all the travel restrictions. So you know all the current laws in place. And they also tell you when they're going to change those laws. So we've been using that, and that's how we're planning how we're going to travel next. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. So once the two years are up and you've seen multiple countries, um, then the plan is that you will choose the one that you feel like is going to be your heart's home and that's where you're going to stay. Yes, Yes, exactly. That's the goal. (laughs) So will you, will you, I know you guys like taught English online when you were here, you know, you've done, you've been realtors. I mean, what, what, what do you think, I guess it depends on where you're going to be, but what, what will you do? Do you think job wise at that point? Hear their answer and the rest of this discussion. Join us for part two, and please be sure to subscribe to their YouTube channel at Lucas World Travel. Thanks. Come run away with me.